What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Guardians of the Future podcast. I know it has been a little bit since we've done one of these, but opening day has already happened for Columbus, and the rest of the opening days are coming very soon next week. So it's time to get back in the regular rotation of these. It should be an interesting season in the Guardians minor league system. Uh, probably not the best the system has ever been, not in quite some time. It's definitely taken a hit, but, you know, as we talk about on Lockdown Guardians, when you graduate players of the ilk of Gavin Williams and Logan Allen and Tanner Bybee and Bo Naylor, and now you're graduating Brian Rocchio, your system's going to take a hit. Those are guys that are playing major parts, should be playing major parts in your major league lineup. So when you graduate, those, that's a good sign for your system because you're putting them through. You know, for years, Cleveland, we talked about players in Cleveland system who were top prospects and were the guys that were holding the, the the system together in terms of lists and excitement and they never panned out. So now you've got three frontline starting pitchers that are in the, in the rotation that you graduated your starting catcher, hopefully as an all-star this year, or as soon as at some point he could be an all-star uh, Brian Rocchio, you're hoping he takes over at shortstop. And, and over the years you've also graduated, you know, Will Brennan and, you know, I know they, they traded Nolan Jones, they traded Will Benson. So there's that. And then you've got guys like Tyler Freeman, who also graduated, Stephen Kwan. This system has has turned out a lot of quality players. I know it hasn't all worked out for the Guardians quite yet in terms of who hasn't quite taken hold at the major league level and who they've traded. But when your system graduates those players, it's a good thing. We just have to capitalize on a few more of them. So, yeah, the system's going to be down a little bit after all that. But, you know, this summer they've got a great chance to reboot the franchise with a, the first overall pick, which we'll get into on today's episode, which we haven't had a chance to do very much yet. Obviously, we did the, the college draft podcast with Willie last time out, and uh, hopefully we'll get into some high school players here soon when time allows. Why don't we start with some injury stuff? Because obviously the injury stuff was was big news since the last time we've had a Guardians of the Future podcast. So we know, unfortunately, at Guards Fest, we heard from Daniel Spino saying he should be getting on a mound, hopefully sometime in April or May. Well. We know that's not going to happen now because the shoulder was bothering him when he was throwing and he had to go back and have a second shoulder surgery now. And he is not going to pitch again in 2024. He, you know, if you're lucky, he's back by the end of 2025 and then who knows what by then. So this is a guy who is going to burn two option years without pitching. He has been your top prospect for a couple of years. It's going to be interesting, interesting to see what happens. I know some people are going to wonder, about putting him on the six-day injured list, creating a roster spot. That's not going to happen. It's pretty obvious he's going to spend all year on the minor league injured list, and he is not going to go on the 60-day IL. Cleveland just has not done that for the most part with anybody because it starts his service time, and he gets major league money. They're just not going to do that. So he is going to be in the minor league injured list, and Cleveland is essentially going to operate with a 39-man roster for the next maybe two years, really all this year and likely next year as well. And again, he, he did, you know, he'll burn his first option this year. Next year, he'll burn his second option when he is unable to pitch for most of the year. The one thing you can say, at least as for Espino, at least the injury wise, is that because of the surgery missing all of his first year on the 40 man roster and, and likely most of the second is that they'll have a good case to apply for a fourth option, which does happen quite a lot of times. Cleveland did it with Sam Hench's, um, they've done it with a couple of, I think, uh, JC Mejia, they did it with initially before they traded him. So the good news on Espino is in terms of, you know, if you're not worried, if you're worried about options and roster spots, yeah, he's going to chew up a roster spot for the next two years on the third, on the 40 man roster. But, um, the surgery that's going to keep him out for a couple you know, for two more years is essentially going to give him a shot to get one of those options back. So he'll burn one and he'll have a fourth option year. So. Essentially, he just burns the option one of those years, which is, I guess, the silver lining and all this. But hard part is now to know whether or not Daniel Espino is going to be able to come back and be the pitcher we all thought he could be. It's it's very hard to have any expectations for him at this point. I don't know what you can really say. You know, obviously, I did my list before the before the season started, before they got to camp, assuming he was going to be healthy this year. I had him number two on my list. And over the last year, I've dropped him from a from a 55 overall to a 50, which 50 is still pretty good. Um, I would imagine in midseason this year, I have a chance I might drop him to 45 because you just can't have any expectation with him. I mean, I already had the risk as high of 
think it goes to extreme now, it's very hard to, uh, to really realize what is going to happen with him. If, when he comes back, I mean, you're just hoping he's healthy. Forget what he might produce on the field. You just hope he can come back and ever be healthy. And then anything that he looks anything like a major league pitcher is a bonus. You just can't have any expectations with him at all. And whatever he gives you, if he it just getting a season of health from him would just be an incredible accomplishment at this point. Um, and if he's 50% or 60% of what he used to be, I think is, is where you're going to be at with him. So that keep the expectations low. Obviously, the last time I was on, we talked about the George Valera injury. I think I can't. Oh, and I came back from from spring training. I did an episode. So George Valera has been injured since then. We knew that. Joey Cantillo is the other big one, obviously, since then. That is a real um, tough thing to swallow for for Cantillo because, A, he was the Guardians' best starting pitching depth in AAA, especially with Gavin Williams and Xavier Curry starting the NEIL. And you don't have anybody in that rotation on the 40 you can call up. which I would imagine when Curry goes out to rehab, he goes into the rotation of AAA just so you have somebody to call up. Um, they acquired Zach Kent, who's a prospect we can talk about. We talked about him a little bit on Lockdown Guardians. You can check that out. But Kent had um, a middling fastball, a good slider. He's a bit older. He's a decent prospect. And it kind of looks like he's going to the bullpen. So I don't know if he's a starting option for them. And then Peter Strzecki, they also got, is going to be in the bullpen there too. So there's nobody on the 40 in AAA for them to call up at this time to be a starter unless you consider Kent a starter. And then hopefully when Curry gets healthy, he goes there. But Cantillo, that's a, a very huge blow for him because, you know, he obviously didn't pitch in 2020. Nobody did unless you were at the alternate site. But even then, that's not real experience. And then he didn't pitch most of 21. He didn't pitch most of 22. And then or I should say he only pitched half of 22 and then 23. He came back, finally had a full season. He looked great, and the coaching staff, the new coaching staff up there in Cleveland down in Goodyear had a lot of great things to say about him. They went out of their way to praise him in spring training a lot, and it just seemed like he was so so close to being a, the first guy up in case they needed a starter, you know, a double header, whatever. If someone got hurt, he'd be up on the call, and now he's out eight to ten weeks with a hamstring injury. Just a guy who can't stay healthy. It's unfortunate. I guess the only, again, with the silver lining with him is it's not an arm injury. It's not an upper body injury. It's just, it's the, uh, it's the hamstring, which is just kind of a freak injury the way he pulled it. So that's going to put him out eight to 10 weeks though. And then you got to ramp him back up. So we're talking about a guy who will be out until June probably. And then he's got to kind of rebuild everything from where he was at. So huge blow for him. Maybe he'll still make his debut this year. We'll see. Um, that's kind of the big one looking across the rest of the injuries here. You know, we did see that, um, Reed Johnston is going to be out for the season with, with Tommy John. And we've got other guys who are going to be on the IL, like Sean Rapp and Elvis Jerez is out for the year with Tommy John. Andrew Misiazic and Nick Mikolacek are still working back from injuries. They should be back at some point this year. Um, we're hoping to see Dylan Delucia and Jacob Zibin pitch at some point this season. As well, Jerson Ramirez is going to miss his second straight year. He had Tommy John, so he's had a lot of surgeries. Just a tough break for for all those guys at this point. So uh, pitching depth in the minors is very fainting at, at this point, so it's going to be tough. On that note, why don't we talk about the rosters? Because the rosters are out. Columbus has already played a couple of games, even though Mother Nature has decided not to get too excited about the minor league season. Maybe they're just trying to help them out with a lack of pitching depth. Um, for the Clippers and just giving them some time to catch their breath um, because it's a rough roster. Let's start with Lynchburg, though, because to me, Lynchburg is easily the best roster in terms of watchability in the minors for the Guardians. It's the most fun roster. and has the most potential. I imagine we'll have our friend Jason Prill, local Clevelander and uh, broadcaster of the Hillcats on quite a bit this year to talk about what's going on there. Obviously, we'll want to have... Marco Lanave from Akron on to talk about um, Jace Lauder quite a bit. And I'm sure we'll find people in Columbus to come on and talk about Kama and Zardo for the couple of weeks he's in Columbus. And then, you know, I'll be at Lake County a lot this year. But let's start with Lynchburg. This is obviously going to be a very fun roster. Um, we'll start with Ralphie Velasquez, who was the first round pick last year. Uh, people got up in arms, or not up in arms, but they wanted to run with, with Velasquez being listed as a first baseman on the initial roster. Uh, when it was released by the Guardians. 
I think there's a very good chance that he is still going to catch quite a bit. So I don't think it's just a, an announcement of saying, oh, he's moving to first base, so catcher's done, and the bat's going to quickly move. I don't think that's going to be the case at all. I think they're going to be – Cleveland's never been aggressive moving a whole lot of guys, especially a high school kid. Um, the new rules with you know limiting to the domestic rosters to 165 – is forcing them to move guys up a little bit quicker, which is good for you know fans. Hopefully, it's good for development. Uh, we'll see if that you know that happens. But it's great to see Ralphie be ready to play at low A at least, and not be stuck in Arizona. But I would probably hold off on the notion that he's just no longer a catcher, and this means that you know they think his bat is so great he's going to move quickly. I would temper that expectation because um, if you look on Lynchburg's roster on their on their MILB page. He is listed as a catcher. I would expect to see him catch as much as he plays first base. He'll probably split. You might see him DH, but they're going to catch him still. I'm hearing that he's still going to catch, and they just want to make sure that he is still getting in the lineup, you know, five days a week and not being bogged down by catcher. They definitely want the bat to develop. So I definitely would not run with it as, oh, Velasquez isn't catching anymore. And that means his bat is going to fly through the system. A, he's still going to catch. B, just, you know, temper expectations. We think that he has a good chance to be a good hitter. Would not surprise me at all if the bat, you know, out progresses the defense to the point where they do sort of pull back on catcher. But at least early on, at least this year, I would imagine he is still going to catch. Manuel Mejias and then Robert Lopez are on that roster. It'll be a three-man rotation that will free up Velasquez to play first, to DH some, which is good. Um, but I would just expect him to also catch and just temper expectations for a kid who's still a teenager. But he's going to be super, super fun to watch. Um, next on the list for me, I mean, you can go between Alex Clemmy and Raphael Ramirez Jr. Clemmy was obviously their second-round pick a year ago out of high school. For him to go to... Lynchburg right away. I mean, Jackson Humphreys was a high school pitcher. They took a few rounds below that the year before, and it took him a couple months to get to Lynchburg to, to the end of the year. I mean, starting there, so that's exciting. And this is a kid who throws, you know, 94 to 98, can hit 99, big breaking ball, funky left-hand delivery with a lot of extension and just a very tough, deceptive delivery. The thing with him is it's a very complicated delivery. It's a lot to repeat, and he has control issues. This could be tough for him. Uh, it could be a tough first year for him in terms of control and um, walking guys. So, you know, temper expectations there as well, but an exciting left-handed arm. Cleveland's never had great luck with taking guys who need help with control but already have big stuff. Usually it's the other way around. They have control, and they kind of help them improve velocity and the other stuff. So another way around for them. And then back over to the position player side, Rafael Ramirez Jr. I think is the most – second most exciting position player on that roster. There's a lot of them. It's hard because you know, Jason Churio's in that roster too, which is fun. Angel is on that roster. That's a lot of fun. Um, Ramirez is going to play short, I would imagine, a lot, but you'll see him rotate between short and third with Christian Napsik, and you'll also have uh, Juan Benjamin in the mix over there at second and and third, and Hanau will probably play some short as well, so they'll, they'll mix all over. But Ramirez, I think, has a chance to be a really fun and exciting player. There's power. He's got a huge arm. He's a gifted defender. He might outgrow the position, so that's going to be a, you know something to look at there. Um, but he is going to be fun to watch. I'm, this is going to be a roster really worth watching. Angel Hanau had some bright spots last year, and he was in Lynchburg. I think he'll get better this year. Could have been better last year, but he, I think he finally got his footing under him. Obviously, Jason Churio got there for a quick cup of coffee. Um, I saw him down when he was down in Arizona. He had looked like he grew his frame a little bit, has added some muscle. That's really exciting expecting a big year from him. Hopefully he ends the year in Lake County. I hope that the, I hope that him and Hanau are both in Lake County for the second half of the season. If things go well, same with Wilfredo Antunez, who I thought had great moments last year, I think can play center field and um, has a little power to his game as well. He's exciting. That's an offense. That's going to do a lot. Christian Napsik, don't sleep on him. Quality defender. We know he's got some good data in terms of um, swing and, Exit not ex velocity, but um, bat speed, which can translate. So we'll see how that goes. I, I'm excited to see Tommy Hawk to see his game in the minors. I think he'll have a great first year in Lynchburg. He's probably too advanced for that level, but uh, it'll be a good start for him. Jackson Humphreys, you know, had some good starts when he made it to Lynchburg last year. So he'll be 
be exciting to watch in that rotation. Matt Wilkinson, the tugboat, uh, looked a little slimmer in Arizona. That was good. Uh, strike throwing machine, just missed a ton of bats in Juco. And then on the Cape was a surprise pick to a lot of people. But, you know, if he slimmed down and still has that control, you can see a little bit of improvements there. Um, you are on Gomez and Alonzo Richardson are back down there as well. The bullpen, it's a little shaky. You've got, uh, you know, Harlow, who was a pick a year ago, who's a little afterthought because of an injury in high school and in college. Jake Barry is six foot 10, and he is the lankiest pitcher I've ever seen in my life. He is all arms and legs. Jack Jaziak was good there for a little bit last year. Ward Crawl and Vasquez can throw hard. And like I said, sometime you'll see Delusia and Zib in there, hopefully at some point. Akron, I know we're skipping around levels here, but I'm just going to go in order of, of interest. And I think Akron is by far the next most interesting roster. Obviously, I've chased the lottery. We know about that. Expect him to move around all three outfield spots this year. Um, I know P.D. Halpin is there and played center regularly last year, but I would expect a lot of the lottery moving to all three spots, DHing, And hopefully he is in Columbus by the end of the year, and he moves quickly too, which allows someone like Jake Fox to move up, which allows someone like Churio to move up would be all things going as you know to best plan. But uh obviously everyone's gonna be watching Chase the Lauder and Akron, but there's a lot of names in this this roster to watch. You've got Cleo Watson who I think is going to move between second and short. I think he's going to see some outfield time as well. I'm really excited to see what he can do in his second year with Cleveland. I, I have a lot of hopes for this kid. It seems like the 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 team has talked a lot about his maturity and his willingness to work and play wherever so he can move up the ladder and help the big league club. I think this fresh start for him has been really, really positive for what people saw at maturity issues in him in, in Miami. So I think this is a good start. And he is just a world of talent. And if Cleveland ends up, you know, getting the most out of him and making it all work, what an absolute steal. So I'm, I'm still excited to watch him. Diane Frias really impressed me last year at Lake County. Um, don't sleep on him. I think he might struggle at first at Akron, but I, I do believe in the glove. And I think he's got enough pop. He'll be really interesting. Some of the big news is that, Joe Lampy reportedly put on some weight over the offseason. Good weight. He looks bigger. Um, I'm a little surprised he went from Lake County Lynchburg just because he struggled a lot in Lake County in the second half of the year. But we'll see what the added weight does for him and if it helps his power at all. Um, essentially had none a year ago, but uh, good bat to ball skills, good outfielder. That's kind of been on the position player side. I would say Cody Huff is interesting because he basically skipped high A. He went from the Rockies low A, low a team to double A here which is unusual, but obviously they wanted to have all these catcher reps and defensively he's probably ready. So we'll see about that. Petey Halpin's back there. Alex Replanez is back. I, I still think he's got a lot of talent, but um, approach is, is rough for him, but he didn't play all last year. So we'll see what he does. I know some people were really high on what Bracho did in 2023. I don't really buy it. I just don't think he has a defensive home and I don't think his bat is going to play in the majors. So the approach is not good. Um, but he's back and he's hanging on, you know, they gave him that big bonus and he's hanging on. He did enough to hang around another year. So we'll see if he can maybe build on that, uh, rotation wise. This is a, a lot of interesting guys in the rotation. It's not exciting in terms of immediate upside and depth, but there is some interest here. You have Doug Nikhazy, who, again, I, everyone knows I still like Doug Nikhazy. Great stuff. Just, you know, can't throw strikes. I'm hoping this is the year he puts it together, but I have doubts. Maybe they move him to the bullpen. That's only if they have the option of moving him to the bullpen. Tommy Mace is back. I have high, higher hopes for him putting it back together. Ethan Hankins showed flashes a year ago in Lake County. Let's see if a year back under his belt helps him in Akron. And then Ryan Webb, I think, will be the breakout pitcher in Akron in terms of starters. I think uh, you know he's 25 now. He led the Arizona Fall League in strikeouts as a pitcher. He was part of that 2021 draft class. I think he'll be the breakout guy there. And would not be surprised if he makes his major league debut this year. I think there's a chance he is that good uh, to force himself. He's going to be have to be on the 40-man roster at the end of the year if they want to protect him in the Rule 5 draft. So the way they've done this before is sometimes if guys are ready and they want to put him on the 40, get him up and get him on and get him some experience beforehand and see if that works. He could be a guy I see that happening with. Low-key, I'm on Ross Carver. I was on him last year. A lot of strikeouts last year. He had some injuries, and then he also had some bad performances, but he missed bats. I think Ross Carver is like a tweak or two away from being a really good mid-rotation prospect, so I expect to see hopefully a healthy year from him would be exciting. Jack Lefwich is there. I don't know what role he's going to be in, but he's back in Akron. 
Uh, I would think he's going to have to start just with the lack of depth, but you know, left, which still had good stuff last year. I think he got a little unlucky. I still like the three pitch mix. I think there's a lot of upside still there and I think he'll move quickly this year. There's Davis Sharp, obviously, who I think is, is about ready as a reliever. He'll be up to Columbus at some point. Tyler Thornton's got good stuff, bad missing stuff. And then obviously the big one is, is Andrew Walters. Cleveland almost never pushes draft guys this hard, this quickly. But they said over the offseason when he was in the, at least in, in spring training, when he was in the future, or the, not the futures game, the spring breakout game, that they were going to push him. And they were going to see how, if it worked. I think there's a very good chance that Andrew Walters is in Cleveland's bullpen by the end of the year, which could be really exciting. Obviously, you probably watch Kate Smith already have a fantastic start to the year. Imagine adding Walters to that bullpen. Maybe Frank Wallenon, too, who we'll talk about. But um, Walters, to me, I think Walters, Boone, and maybe the Lauder. Maybe all those guys make their major league debuts from Akron to Cleveland this year. That's who I would look for. Um, Walters, Webb, and then DeLauder in that order just to see if Cleveland gets time to figure out their outfield first. But that's going to be an exciting team with all those guys there. So, um, you know, Akron's got is on TV in terms of MILB TV. There's plenty of good AA affiliates. Lynchburg is on MILB TV. It's an okay feed. Uh, at least it was a year ago. Uh, video wise, quality wise, it's it's okay. Could be better. There are some good ones. Fredericksburg is a great MILB TV feed in, in low A. There's not a lot of other good ones, unfortunately. Um, but they're you know they're decent. They won't have their first game. First games on MILB TV. They're in Down East, and that's not a TV platform. So you know Alex Clemmie's making that first start. You won't see Alex Clemmie's debut in Down East, unfortunately. We'll hear about it. That's about it. I guess we'll move on to Lake County from here. Lake County. I'm trying to think the big, there's not a lot of big names here. You know, Jake Fox is repeating Lake County. I thought he was solid last year. He was starting to really find his offensive game a little more. Um, defensively, he really settled in the center field. I like that. Um, I think he would have gone to Akron if it wasn't for Plenez and Lampy and, and Halpin and obviously DeLauder. But I think, you know, Halpin hopefully is in Akron or in Columbus and in DeLauder too. And you can move Fox up. That'd be good. I'm excited by the prospect of Alex Mooney in, in high A. I think, you know, they paid a million dollars to him to get him signed and forced them to push two other guys to college they wanted to sign. So they really like Mooney. So it should be interesting to see what he can do. Kind of a gritty gamer type, um, gets the most out of his abilities. Jose Devers was pretty interesting in Lynchburg last year. Hits the ball hard for a little guy. Good defense at short, good speed. Could be a very under the radar prospect. CJ Kafis, I think, has a chance to tap into a little more power. We'll see if Cleveland can help him there. Um, play in first base. Nate Furman had a great year in Lynchburg, at least the first half of it. And then he got to Lake County and just completely slowed down in front of the show. Obviously, Nate Furman, we had him on a year ago on this podcast. I'm expecting him to really rebound big to start the year in Lake County now that he's got a year under his footing. And then Cooper Ingle uh, was part of last year's draft class as well. He got up to Lake County late in the year. Looked really good. Solid defender. He's going to stay a catcher. Um, could play elsewhere, but the bat should play. And then pitching-wise, it's going to be interesting. You know, Parker Messick's back, even though he didn't need to be. Parker Messick should be an Akron. Jeez, Parker, Parker Messick probably should have been an Akron last year, and he probably should be in Columbus this year at some point. But uh, I hope he's not there for long for good reasons for him and for other pitchers as well. But Parker Messick will be back, and I'm sure he'll he'll carve up the Midwest league because he just doesn't belong in, in high a, belong in double a, but you know, they got to fill innings somehow. Steven Hajar is back. Could not throw a strike a year ago when he did, he missed a lot of bats, but it was a lot of, a lot of walks. Hopefully again, another guy like Doug Nikhazy and, and Alex Clemmy, big arm, but hopefully they can tame it. Austin Peterson was really solid a year ago in Lynchburg. Didn't miss a lot of bats. So I kind of, you know, I'm down on that. If he couldn't dominate low A, I'm not sure he's going to do in high A, but, you know, a solid arm who's going to give you innings. Trenton Denholm is going to start again in Lake County. I like his stuff. Just he has to be able to pitch a full season with his uh, body type and, and not be able to hold velocity. Jake Miller was a, was kind of a high money guy for a 20th round pick two years ago. Had, had obviously Tommy John. He's back. He made it back last year. Um, we'll see if Cleveland can figure things out with him. Big name in the bullpen to watch to me is Zane Morehouse. And then obviously Jay Driver and Magnus Ellerts are there too. But Morehouse bounced around a lot of colleges, pitched at Texas, has some interesting pitch data, throws hard, very tough angle. So I think he'll move 
fairly quickly um, if he can throw some strikes. Ellert's had some good numbers a year ago, and Jay Driver's a side armor, so you just never know. And then in <laughs> Columbus, uh, it's kind of a mess. You've got Kyle Manzardo. The offense is interesting. You've got Manzardo. Tana, I think, had a good year offensively last year. I think the upside's limited, though. Burrito obviously is not far off from, from being major league ready. You've got you know Jonathan Rodriguez, who was good a year ago in Columbus, who I think um, might get a look in Cleveland at some point this year. Obviously, Miles Straw is there after the whole roster debacle there. Um, Daniel Schneeman, everyone talked about Daniel Schneeman in, in um, spring training. And I just don't see how he is going to make the 40-man roster this year without moving someone like Atena or um, – Arias at Rocchio or, or Angel Martinez when he goes there. Angel Martinez, by the way, I should bring this up. He is on the major league injured list, not the triple A injured list because his spring training injury when he fouled ball off his foot and had a contusion occurred before he was optioned back to the minor league camp. So they had to keep him on the major league roster um, injured list for that. So he'll have to go on rehab in Columbus. And after he does come back and starts rehabbing, He'll be taken off the injured list and option the AAA. That'll burn the option. But uh, don't read any, anything into that because I don't think he is going to be on the major league roster. Uh, they just don't have don't have room up there unless they decide to move on from Gabby Arias, which I just I just don't see happening. So that's why I don't think Schneeman can even crack the forty. Even though Schneeman deserves to be someone's utility infielder, he's hitting the ball harder. He plays a good third base. He plays solid at second. He's okay at short. He can play the outfield. Hard worker, consummate teammate, all that stuff. He'll be somebody's Mike Freeman somewhere someday. I don't know if it's going to be Cleveland, but he is a Mike Freeman type player, and he does deserve a look at the major league level in that role. Obviously, if Noel, he's on his last option year. It's now or never for him. And then you got the rotation. Uh, Will Dion had a really rough first start in St. Paul. It was cold, and he threw some some bad fastballs that got hit really hard. This is going to be a big year for him. Obviously, you know, we love Will Dion on this podcast, too. We had him on a few weeks ago, and I'm excited to see what he can do at AAA. He missed some bats. I'll give him that. He missed some bats. Just a couple of really, really hard hit balls. The rotation behind that, just not anything to write home about with Cantillo hurt. And then, obviously, you have, I think, Curry will rejoin that rotation when he comes back. But it's Connor Gillespie, who was a rule, minor league rule five pick. Adam Aller, who was a minor league signing. Hunter Stanley, who... Probably should be a reliever, but it's solid. And there's Zach Kent, who I think goes to the bullpen. Um, it's going to be a mess to figure out who starts in this rotation. And then the bullpen, you've obviously got Franco Alamon, who hopefully pushes his way to Cleveland at some point this year. Um, Tanner Burns is out there, but I don't have – I don't know. I guess we'll see. I, I hope Burns pitches well enough to force himself into a major league option, but uh, I have doubts at this point and see where his velocity is. Nick Enright is throwing 92-95. Previously, was 90-94. But again, he is 27 and he, you know, beat cancer last year, came back from that rule five uh, opportunity in Miami that just never worked out. I think he deserves a major league look. It may not be here. Maybe it will be. It'd be a great story. But I think at some point he is going to pitch in the major leagues. I just don't know if it's going to be here or not, but he deserves it. We'll see what Anthony Ghost can do down there. Uh, Mason Hickman is as a reliever down there. He's interesting. Uh, strike thrower with kind of a rising fastball that's hard to hit, even though it's like 90-92 and a huge curveball. Some guys missing from rosters. Gabriel Rodriguez, third baseman last year in Akron, who really struggled, is not on a roster right now. Outfielder Connor Cox, who I think is a, is a fourth or fifth outfielder candidate, was a, a draft pick 2021, the only college hitter they took. He is not on a roster. I think Sean Rapp is hurt. Isaiah Green is not on a roster. would not surprise me if this is his last run in Cleveland. Just has not really worked out for him at this point in that trade. And then... Um, Johnny Tincher's not on a roster. He was the catcher last year. Maybe he's already going to retire and coach. Who knows? Um, he's not on a roster. Carson Tucker, not on a roster. I don't have enough time to go into the Carson Tucker thing. Just not good. Um, now, we didn't talk about Justin Campbell and the injuries. Justin Campbell's having Tommy John. He is going to be out for the year. So he has to have to throw a pro pitch in two seasons between two elbow surgeries. Not great for Justin Campbell. That could have made a big difference in terms of the Guardians' pitching depth and the strength of their system. but obviously has not worked out. So those are a couple guys that are missing from rosters so far. Um, before we get out of here in this episode, let's do a quick draft update. And obviously, if you're a listener to this podcast, I hope you're a subscriber at Next Year in Cleveland. We have continued to do the 1-1 stock watch list 
every week we just kind of recap what each potential first overall pick has done over the past week or so or weekend i should say um and just kind of ranking where we are in terms of the viability of being a number one pick this week i still have travis bazana number one but i tell you what charlie condon is really pushing his way into that conversation it's it's really one a one b and it's getting closer and closer every weekend neither bazana or condon has really faced a lot of good pitching though because it's not a good pitching class um the best pitcher bazana faced this year was was hagan smith and he struck out three times against hagan smith so that's where that's at condon you know i know he had a home run off drew beam over the weekend but um beam has just not been that impressive this year at tennessee and, and a lot of tennessee arms just have not been great in the pros i mean they kind of ruined Chase Dallander. Chase Burns left them. Um, Blade Tidwell, who's in the Mets organization from a couple of years ago, just has not been impressive either. So being a Tennessee pitcher, I don't know. It's just not not great. So I'm not going to sit there and put Drew Beam up in the conversation of, well, kind of dominated him, and he's a great pitcher. So, But the guy, you know, I'm still 1A and 1B on those guys, but the guy that's really pushing his way into the conversation that I'm starting to like is Braden Montgomery. More defensive versatility or, or value than the first two guys because – Surefire, probably a right fielder, but a guy who can play a plus right field has a huge arm in right field. Switch hitter, tons and tons of power. Solid chase rate, not fantastic. Um, and I think he's going to hit. So I think Braden Montgomery is really getting himself in the conversation. Nick Kurtz came back, got a couple of home runs. That was good to see. Still a lot of time left, but. I think I think the top three for me right now it's it's a one two or three choice and it's Bazana Condon Montgomery. We'll see. There's still you know two months to go at this point and hopefully some of these guys are getting into the College World Series and we can see them face upper echelon pitching. We'll find out, but uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Stay tuned. Make sure you're listening to Lockdown Guardians every day. Make sure you're subscribed to all the good content. I just have to finish off my uh, prospect rankings and scouting reports over at Next Year in Cleveland. I'm still you know. As I'm hosting a podcast five days a week and have a full-time job and trying to have a life, uh, writing every day is a lot. But I've only got 15 prospects to go, so I will finish that by the end of April. I'll have all 50 profiles completed. I'll have to do one on Zach Penn at some point. So it'll be 51 probably, plus I think I did a watch list of like 15 more. So a lot of those are still up there. Take a look at those and uh, make sure you're subscribed in there. And we'll keep having draft content. We'll come back and hopefully do... Um, something soon on high school play high school players in the draft this year with willie that and then as i said obviously we'll have on all of our broadcasting from akron and lynchburg i'll check in from lake county i'll have some interviews to play there as well audio wise hopefully we'll get some other interviews on here but um yeah we're back my league season's back expect to have this podcast back in your rotation at least by bi-monthly i'll try to do more than in the off season, we're only doing maybe one a month at that. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to promise every week just with my schedule, but I think every other week sounds fair enough. So yeah, expect more and then we'll do some mailbags, all that kind of fun stuff. Thank you all for listening and um, sticking with me as I continue to try to keep this podcast afloat and while I'm doing a million other things in terms of content and uh, appreciate the diehards who listen and uh, yeah, stay tuned. We'll be back next time I'm on. I'll probably have some observations from Lake County and we'll have some minor league games to talk about. So thanks for listening. Until then, see ya.